Welcome everybody. Thanks for coming to the transmitter demonstration. Our RP director John Howe is going to be demonstrating how we track eagles with the transmitters that Brett Maddernack and the team at Eagle Valley have placed to help us study the Decorah eagles. So here he comes, John Howe. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming everyone. Uh, and and uh, good to see all the folks that might get to see this online for our virtual presentation. Um, we're going to talk about the tracking of the eagles that we do. It's been being done since D1, and that would have been back in the, I can hopefully refer to Amy for that. When did that start? About 20? That started 2011. 2011. Oh, no, okay. Yeah. So, and that program really came out of the question is, where are these decor eagles going? And everybody wanted to know that. And Brett Mandernack with the Eagle Valley uh, Kohler uh, Nature Preserve over in Wisconsin, just a little bit south of Prairie Machine, has been doing eagle research for decades. And so uh, Bob, knowing Brett very well from way back in the University of Minnesota uh, Raptor Center days and, and other uh, work with falcons, basically they teamed up to uh, track, trap, and transmit a transmitter like this on the back of the eagles and then track and do a study of where the decor eagles go and what happens to them. Um, definitely something that has been controversial. Many people are of the mindset of why would you do something like that to this beautiful animal? Um, and it's something that we know from studies that it isn't something that impedes their life or could cause an end to their life. But I tell you what, one of the couple of things that we've learned very important. I mean, what we've learned is that probably the highest mortality rates for the core eagles are electrocution on top of poles, and that is that has basically uh, uh, resulted in, at least in this area, and the problem becoming more well known that the tops of the poles need to be made in a fashion that they won't electrocute eagles and other raptors. Um, we found out that there's a significant number of eagles that are hit from the ones that we've tracked, our own statistics and what we know uh, from recovery and rehab center statistics that eagles get hit when they're eating roadkill. They eat fly food and they also eat carrion. So uh, it's gotta be something safe, but it's something that people like me once in a while when I see something and I see eagles or vultures, I'll move that safely uh, on, on to the side of the road if I can. Definitely not something to cause a road accident or anything. You have to be careful when you do those things. The other thing is our most recent uh, eaglet uh, and the one that this transmitter came from was uh, from being uh, uh, killed basically by eating and ingesting lead shot. So this is the transmitter that we put on D35 along with D36, who's now just in southern Minnesota. Uh, D35 uh, uh, was uh, uh, died earlier this year. We tracked that. We saw that the signal had stopped. We checked that. It's like, okay, it looks like we have something going on. They tracked it. They found it in the snow. Uh, and when it came, that sore, because a lot of the lead analysis work uh, for the state of Iowa, where lead uh, poison birds Get that process done. These transmitters are put around the wings 
down through the wing tip, back up to the back. And these are very flexible. People have asked, can that get in the way of them, you know, copulating or having young and things like that. The studies have shown that these things do not deter that process. So uh, D27, who we know is right in the Iowa area and like what, four or five years old, got a white head. And so, uh, you know, she's gonna be uh, breeding age here real soon. The only unfortunate thing is that these tracking uh, uh, the, the GPS tracker here and the VHF uh, radio transmitter here, this one lasts for about two, maybe three years maximum. This one I think is up to like maybe three to five plus years, uh, depending. It's got little solar panels built in here. Um, I can show you guys this. There's the antennas. Here's some of the straps that were cut. They're Teflon straps. D27 is past the time point where this works, but we're still getting data from the satellite transmitter. And we know that she's over uh, east on Pole Line Road, or west on Pole Line Road, just over on the Upper Iowa River, over towards Bluffton. It is. It's a function of battery life. Um, otherwise, these things would just, if there's a power solution to this thing, we could do it pretty much indefinitely. So, for the folks here that might not be able to see that close, here's a nice uh, shot of this. Uh, um, there's actually a little magnet that goes on this unit that can stop it from depleting the battery. And same thing, there's a magnet on here stopping this from sending data up to the, the satellite. Okay. So there's our transmitter. What we have to do the tracking, there's a couple different uh, antennas. This is a VHF antenna. There's also uh, an antenna that will track directly with the, the satellite. Um, so if you know when the satellite data is coming through, which is like every, goes every six hours on, six hours off, if I remember right from talking to Brett. If you know that frequency, then uh, you're able to go out and actually use a smaller little antenna to locate where the eagles are, about the same distance, about uh, up to five, six miles. So I'm going to show you how we do this process. And this is going to work good here today. Um, I'm not going to be able to get some audibles today because unfortunately the NICAD batteries in this um, would not charge. And it looks like they are either expired and will have to be replaced. Uh, which I can do, but obviously I don't have replacement batteries. So Amy's going to serve as our transmitter. She knows how this works. She volunteered right there. She's been practicing. I didn't even have to ask her. She's so good. All right. So this is what this is our antenna. Just you know, same same uh, technology as your TV antennas. Yes, the UHF. This is the, yep, this is the, we, it's a brand name Yagi or style Yagi antenna. This one has five holes on it. Some of them have three. This one has a range of up to like three to five miles, uh, depending on, you know, hills and valleys and what's in the way. I've, uh, the last time I used this successfully was D35 up uh, just south of the Twin Cities. She was hanging out just on the Minnesota River. And that was uh, because there was like, tons of eggs in, in October, November, and December right by the Burnsville, Minnesota landfill. So there's obviously there's varmints and other things and food pieces and things at those landfills that attract uh, birds at certain times of the year. So that's the last time I got to use this was when we tracked D35 up there. Um, and she was down in Iowa when she uh, when she ate the, the lead and, and died. So, so this is hooked into the unit here. And it, basically, the, the system works as uh, if I was pointing straight at this transmitter and it was up, you know, straight up on the bluff ahead of me, if I'm directly aligned with it, we're going to get the strongest volume signal. So what would that sound like, Amy? Beep, beep, beep. <laughs> or would it be more like ding, ding? It's yeah. a beep. Ding, beep. Oh. <laughs> it's more of a beep than a ping. Yep, you got it. So as I move to the side, that will get lower. 
So there's three little knobs here. Um, I believe that it's written right on here right now on this magnet. The one that was on D35 is frequency 645. So I can dial 6, 4, and 5. And then if this was working, um, we'd hear the <laughs> like that. And then beep, beep, a little higher pitch than that. Um, and uh, that's basically how that works. So we're picking this up. And that allows us to track and locate and
listening to somebody about DDT and the effects on raptors, and DDT did not have the same effect on golden eagles as it did with bald eagles, peregrine falcons, and other birds that eat fish primarily because the DDT would bioaccumulate in the fish fatty tissues. Mammals don't have that kind of same pairing of reserves and concentrations and bioaccumulation of DDT and its metabolites as fish species do. So golden eagles pretty much were spared from the egg thinning, shell thickening, and the crushing of the eggs, which really caused almost the extinction or extirpation of the bald eagle and peregrine falcon in North America here. Out in the western states and up in Canada were areas where that wasn't happening as much because it just wasn't applied near as heavily as it was down here in the U.S. states area. But that's what we're going to be doing. We're going to continue tracking D36. He's just currently north of the Iowa-Minnesota border on the Rook River by Chatfield, kind of hanging out there between there and Preston, Minnesota. Right now, you know, if I had time on the way back home or whatever, in the next week or so, I'd go back and forth to Decorah, probably pull this out, get his frequency dialed in, and see if we can locate him and see where he is. He's been hanging out on the Rook River there for, it's been over a month, I'm pretty sure. So any questions you guys have? Actually, I go through Spring Grove, Caledonia, up to La Crosse is the shortest route. Could go all the way towards Rochester to I-90 and do that. I'm going to be heading that way late Saturday night, so I don't think I'm going to be doing that at the night time. Amy, if she or somebody else who, well, actually I can't do that because the battery is not working. I'd have to get another unit from Brett. Brett's about two hours away from here, so. Good question. I'm going to have to wait until I get this battery thing. I was calling your name as I was coming south on Wednesday, and she just didn't show up. Yeah, probably. When you say D-27 sent the postcard, is that something that you have to go looking for to see? You have to go to a program to look for? So Brett gets the raw data, and then he shares that with us, and Amy takes that and she works it up. Brett and Ryan and the crew there, Brett and Ryan primarily put those nice colored maps with the satellite images on it, and then we can further refine it. I'll show you a cool map that Amy put together, which really was kind of helping us see and think and look like an eagle, and that is if you are in Chatfield and you're high enough where eagles typically fly, with the curvature of the earth, you can actually see Decorah and see the whole river system and everything. So people wonder why eagles can track and other raptors can track the landscape so well. They're not limited just to what we see with everything blocking things. When they're up in the air and they're where they typically migrate, they can see probably 50-plus miles ahead. It's probably more than that, whatever that limitation is. What altitude do they normally? They can go up to 10,000 feet, and I think I used a look at the horizon, and I can't factor in their excellent eyesight, but I think I figured that maybe as high up as they are, the horizon would be around 130 to 140 miles at one point. So I looked at 10,000 feet through Google Earth, and you could see Decorah. And you guys, I'm just going to break in really quickly here. If you go to our website at www.raptorresource.org, roll over, explore, you'll see an eagle maps option, and our interactive maps will allow you to play around. There's a bit of a learning curve on it, but not too bad, and you can see the travels of any of the eagles we've tracked. So much fun. Yeah, it's really fun. One question? How long did the eagle equipment last? And how long would you say the technology has come since that happened? I don't think these have changed that much. I'm pretty sure that these units that we've used up until last year are the same 
there's been a few improvements over ten years, but they're basically about the same size, they use the same technology, the same antennas. right now we're moving towards a little bit smaller unit and it also uses cellular data too and it will, once it gets in, it'll collect data but once it gets close enough to cellular signal it will start start dumping the data. it's not much, I guess I haven't the North American Banding Council recommends that any kind of tracking or banding technology be less than five percent of its weight on any given bird I don't remember the weight either, but this is I believe one percent or less of the weight on birds, it's way under very low good questions, any others? after five years, you know you said the batteries last maybe four years max-ish will that fall off? it will not people talked about the possibility of having you know, straps and things that could be designed to fall off or that you could just press a button and it would release and things like that and it's just, I mean we know that the reliability, the best technology that we have right now is that we can communicate with these things if they're successful all the time for about maybe up to three to five years so you'd have to do it in that time period, it'd have to work all the time otherwise, I guess if it malfunctioned and it came off you know, prematurely or something, that's the other thing is, you know, if it came off and only half of it was attached then that would really be a big problem so the prevailing reasoning is put it on, put it on permanently so it can't come off accidentally partially and cause damage to the bird. We already know that I mean, we look at this and we think that you know, oh my gosh, the eagle's like they're not looking in the mirror saying boy, I wish this thing wasn't on my back they just, they're not, they don't think like humans they just, they grew up with it, they've had it on their whole life they even preen the antennas just like their feathers you know, you look on this one, there's a couple little hack marks from the beak there, you know, so they, they it just, from what we observe and what we see, it looks like it just becomes part of their body I just, what is the estimated population of bald eagles uh, boy, I know we're, um, that's something that I don't have committed to memory. Wisconsin and Iowa stopped counting, so they, the DNRs of both states used to do counts, and eventually there were so many eagles, they're just like, we're doing pretty well here, so we are going to put our limited resources towards a species that hasn't recovered. So a lot of times, not always, but a lot of times states will pay close attention to an endangered or threatened species, once they start the delisting process and it's delisted in the state, then they'll tend, they'll drop off the radar and they'll turn their attention to something else. And peregrine falcons, are they still a species peregrine of falcons, concern in Wisconsin? Are, yeah, they're still uh, endangered and threatened in Wisconsin, and that has to do actually with a deal that Bob Anderson and Greg Sefton, I believe, brokered with the Wisconsin DNR that until they had a sizable cliff, con uh, cliff population, that they wouldn't consider delisting them because they weren't necessarily truly independent unless you had a large population spread across a wide variety of habitats. Right. So. And that's one of the neat things uh, that, that we get to do. We've got a, a volunteer crew of folks that uh, early in the year they help uh, through boats and through spotting scopes and Amy and I do it too along with Dave Kester, Sophia and, and others, uh, uh, Bill Smith. Uh, they our team goes up and down the river and looks at the historic sites that we know because they're probably going to come back to the same site if there's nothing that gets in the way of that um, but we're looking for new sites there's we're finding that they're nesting in a lot of places we've got you know four or five nests or four nests at least in the Winona area and Fountain City area that are within a fairly small you know radius and we I guess we're getting a good idea of how close they can tolerate other falcons near them but the neat thing about that is we're part of that monitoring process that obviously is going to help the state make those decisions yes so peregrine falcon monitoring and banding work that we do John, I think I heard you mention that the GPS data you get has an accuracy of five to six kilometers is that right? 
I didn't mention that. No, the GPS data is tight. I can't tell you exactly how tight it is. It's probably meters. Yeah, all right, that's what I thought. It's meters. And maybe even less than that. Good, I was worried. How are the Eagle sequence tracks? So what we do is we habituate them to come down to mulch piles that work good in the decor area. And I think that idea came up because it was either being used or they like to sit on mulch piles over by the refuse mulch piles that are just on the other side here way, way back when. But we'll use the Pan Am trap. It looks like a metal hoop. And it's got little loops of netting. It's got netting and then it's got little loops of filament coming up that they walk in there and then their feet get caught in that. And then as they try to move, the nooses get tighter and that will just immobilize them. So we'll put a hula hoop out there, or we did, put a hula hoop out there with fish. They get used to going in there. They eat the fish. And then one day we replace the hula hoop with an actual trap and we're all prepared and everybody's ready to go. It's usually very early in the morning. And it's been a very successful process from what I've seen. And when Brett yells go, we don't say how fast we go, as fast as we can. I mean, you've got to understand, from the point that Brett determines that eagle is caught to the point we're there. And the Pan Am trap is held basically with more or less, not really a bungee, but something springy. So it can't fly off with it or hit the end and get shot. But we're also there, I don't know, a second, two seconds? It's under 10 seconds. Oh, we're not far away. We're hidden, but we're not too far away. Just like falconers have done through the ages, once the hood is put over their eyes, they breathe and they breathe fine. It doesn't hurt them and they just calm down. It's just like nothing is going on. So they get measured, weighed, the transmitter is put on, and then they're checked for anything that they might notice as an issue and then released. So you do that right at the site where they're trapped? Yeah, yeah. We've typically done it here in the garage over at the whole house. So you transport the eagle then? We just walk it over here, you know, a couple hundred feet. Because it is still there is a good one somewhere. It's down here, I think, right? If you trap them at the landfill? We trap them right here. Oh, right here? Right here. Oh, you put the mulch piles are here? Yeah, we put a mulch pile over here. Yep, yep. Is it lack of funding that is causing you to not do this more often, or you just don't want to be overloaded with data? We've done as much as we have opportunity to and as much as we feel like we can manage with the staff that we've got. And, you know, we can coordinate with somebody like Brett Mandernack, who is, you know, up for a researcher that has been doing this his whole professional career. And, you know, it really has to do with what he has capacity to do. And Jeff, I saw Jeff was there. Jeff is our, me and Jeff are the official RRP employees, right? Jeff just came on, he's half time. And basically, Jeff and Brett are the ones who are going to be working on the Golden Eagle study. If Jeff was not here and Jeff was not interested and Jeff didn't, you know, had the interest and the excitement to do this, we wouldn't be doing it. So it really is, what would we want to do? What would be neat to know? What are some things that we could do? It has to do with the interest of our resources and it also has to do with, you know, what we can do. There's other folks out on the West Coast I know doing eagle tracking studies still and things like that. So it's not probably done as much because we're getting a lot of data and people know a lot more about eagles and raptors and what's happening. But I tell you what, with the climate change that's happening right now, we are seeing shifts in cycles of nesting and migration and with the kestrel, you know, depletion of numbers that nobody fully understands right now. So these monitoring and tracking studies, I don't think there's any less need for them. They're probably going to get even more necessary to help us try to understand how we're affecting these populations and then try to recover and do something to alleviate that. Any questions on the Golden Eagle study? Yeah, any questions? I think we 
i was telling them just as some a little bit of interest points for that but does anybody have any questions how we would be doing this with the golden eagles or yeah and jeff if you want to come over here we are we have an audience a virtual audience that can see us oh, okay. right here all right so we do have we're very fortunate we have a wintering population of golden eagles here in the driftless they come down they're generally known as the eastern population there's the eastern and western population as you know golden eagles are circumpolar they're found around the globe at these latitudes um, but they're certainly divided between kind of rocky mountain california alaska and this eastern canadian population which is considerably different in their behaviors and what they do so these birds uh summer if you will in the, in the arctic above nunavik above hudson's bay above churchill where all the stories of the polar bears are right or they live north of that yet and they come down oh to new york state the appalachians areas very much like the driftless and they also come here in the driftless during the winter months they arrive in December and stay through the end of February, beginning of March. Um, and what we're trying to do is, is understand their migration, their nesting, what they're doing, where they're going, what they're eating. It's not so much of it is known. Five years ago, as a younger fella and a falconer being out here. <laughs> um, and then finally, they started to get noticed, and ooh, my gosh, they are, there are golden eagles. And uh, so several years ago, I started with a project in association with Audubon. Uh, we trapped a golden and uh, backpacked it. We had a few others that we were able to trap accidentally. A couple car strikes, or the bird survived and it was releasable. One guy... to employ techniques that are used by RRP and the Falconry community to trap these birds on purpose, very humanely, and do it very, very quickly, uh, where we're trapping them, backpacking them, and releasing them, just like is done here at RRP. Our issue sometimes is in the middle of January, up on top of a goat prairie, and it's 20 below zero. So working very handed outside is kind of difficult then. The big difference is who tracking bad cats is a new generation that carries cellular data now to do GPS and the VHS signals. We're going to get a cellular signal. When they go north and they go on cellular link range, we lose the data. Uh, when they come back and we get as massive data dumped, Turkeys. 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 Turke
Yeah. Now they'll take fox squirrels, gray squirrels, rabbits, absolutely. They take geese, they take ducks, they take, take We have a guy call me one morning and he checked your email, he's jumping out of his socks. No, why? I'm a bow hunter and my trail cam got the most incredible footage you're gonna you're not gonna believe it. I'm talking to him, I bring it up. There's about fifty photos. Group of deer going down the trail early in the morning, right at daybreak. Here comes an immature now, immature golden. Took down an 80-pound deer on the deer trail. Oh my God. One tail on the base of the spine, one on the head. Good night, nurse. Work intense. Now, here was the incredible thing. So I went up, you know, that day later. Let that bird be, leave it alone, give it some privacy, right? Get up there towards sunset. Saw this bird take, took an obviously very large crop. I wonder if he'll come back. Never came back. Really? Next morning, you know, it's, it's January. That, that deer is hard as ice, right? So the coyotes and the, er, the chickadees and everything else, and blue jays and whatnot, all set up on it. It's gone pretty quick. Never came back. Um, they do the same with turkeys, both on the ground and in the air. So we're talking to these guys. So as an example, turkeys roost in trees, if you didn't know that. They get up in the trees at night, sunset. The great thing about being a golden eagle researcher, following them, hunting turkeys, turkeys don't come out of the trees till like nine. You know, they're not like crack and dawn. <laughs> you get to sleep in a little bit, you know. But you can see them up on the ridge. They're like three quarters of the way up in trees, you know. And they'll start coming out. They're going to go to their field that they're feeding on. Usually where there was a, they know exactly where there was a grain transfer and there's big dumps and beans and corn. And, you know, they're going right there. And doop, they're going across. Here comes two, three. Here comes a lone jay. Mid-size, 12-pound bird. There's a brown dot, 1,200 feet up. It's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And kaboom, hits them in the air. I've also seen them go in where there's large flocks and just go into the flock and drill one. Like, you know, everybody else runs for cover, I can tell you that. Um, amazing hunters. They can crash through the brush just like a goshawk when they're going after a fox squirrel. They're good at fox growth and they seem to like them. Not sure why that is, but they do. And uh, as another just amazing thing found from the cellular data, the pair in Kentucky, it's a mated pair, which is what we're going for. Um, we're really trying to get mated pairs as much as we can. So we don't under really know much about what they're doing. Certainly up north at the nest site. No one's watched them, but we have no idea. Um, so these birds will copulate the day they're leaving, maybe the day before, and they split. She goes all the way to New York State, the eastern edge around the Great Lakes. She's going up above Hudson's Bay. He goes west up to the Driftless, hangs here for a week or two, then he goes up the western side of the Great Lakes, and get this. <laughs> The last two years they arrived at the nest site at the same day. <laughs> they were copulating within hours of each other. If they arrived, they could pick out all the data points and then they could see them right on top of each other. And then they're apart because they're getting live feeds like every couple seconds to get the data. What do you think they're eating up there, I asked them. Waterfall, no doubt about it. You see them fly out over water, 1,200 feet because the data gives us elevation. This is insane information. And then we see a straight scoop right on the edge of the water where there's swans. So we know it's waterfowl. Geese, swans, they got it all up there, right? They got everything. We're not sure exactly, but we know most likely waterfowl. So the next big hurdle is for us to get pairs. What's their fidelity to this area? Anecdotally, we see the same, what we believe are the same pairs in the exact same valley every year. Are they, is there fidelity to the driftless? Is there fidelity to the north end, the south end? Are the, is it common for them to go completely different routes? Did the young hang with them the first year at all? Um, what determines whether they're east coast birds, Appalachians, or driftless birds? There's so much 
yet for us to learn. We're going to get a handle on that. And the next huge hurdle is to send John up to polar bear country. With with cameras, because uh, that is never ever filmed. <coughs> Nothing like that has ever been filmed. So uh, our RP and thanks to people like you that donate and are involved and help get the word out. Our RP is able to fund this research and uh, situation may be and you're in a blind some distance away with the control mm -hmm. you do that with golden eagles you'll never catch one we would watch them hunt they root they never hunt in the valleys they roost in i love that about them they always hunt valleys over and they are looking for coolies that are have big groups of, of turkeys in them and they love cruising the bluff line because of the ridge line, they'll get a nice updraft and they can just cruise it, cross the valley, cruise the other side of the, you know, the ridge line, you know, and they're up 800 feet above the ridge line. Um, so we'll put a, a look-alike to our wild turkeys, they're called Spanish blacks, we use them. But we quickly discovered if we are in the valley in a blind, they will not come in that valley. Now, you tell me, we're in that blind at 3 a.m. They don't start, they don't start until 3 starts to it's just like 9, 10 o'clock. Especially when there's a little, you know, uh, piece been generated that gives them some updraft on the ridge line. So they have no idea we're there, right? They know we're there. <laughs> so it's got to be understood. Are they seeing our heat signature? And they're seeing the heat waves coming off of our, our blind, and they they're that flippin' smart. They are shy. Um, when you can, when you get one, I've had the opportunity to actually handle several of them. Wild birds. They are incredibly mellow and docile, which blows my mind. The most intense predator, aerial predator on the planet is a sweetie. <laughs> and one that we trapped, we got it late in the day, kind of funny story, the guy who had the, the transmitter, I called him, I'm like, Mark, we've got a bird, get down here right away. Like, I'm going in for hernia surgery in 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so we had to trans get the transmitter and then hold the bird and I did it the next day and we flipped that bird, we flipped that bird but that's our glass. How do you tell a golden from an immature ball? Okay, a couple real key features. My favorite to tell people that are looking at birds, um, because they are easily confused with immature ball, there's two things to focus on. Armpit, under the wing, if there's any white at all, it's an immature ball. They are black as night, and they're even juvenile, adult, all the same, but you know, I don't know, and John can, and Amy can help. How many immature balls have you seen that don't have some white in here? They, they're, they've got it. The other thing is when you're looking up, number one is the snaz. This is an old crowd, you'll get this. They got, bald eagles have a Jimmy Durante snaz, don't they? Yeah. They got a big dang beak on them. Baldies don't. They've got a nice little hawk beak on them. Okay. And you can look up and see that can opener or a very refined beak and bam, you know. Sometimes the light won't let you really see the underside. You know, juveniles have a white patch on there. They're, they're booty feathers, you know, back there. And some white on their underside. Do they have down to their feet? No. Down far, but not all the way down. Right. And where in Wisconsin is the best place to try it? Hopefully you might see it over in England. Well, right or here. Or Iowa. Yeah. So generally the way it looks is like a mile to two towards the river, 
the river about a mile or two out. That's kind of bald eagle country. Yeah. I mean, they go out in the, in the county, right? Because they're looking for dead deer in the winter. But generally, that's their goldings are generally outside that zone. Anywhere there's bluff country. And the best way to find goldens, ask turkey hunters. <laughs> Where, you know, when turkey season's over, you, can, you know, they're usually totally into it as well. And they'll many times have know, have seen them, right? Because they're out maybe early, early, early spring. And you'll have a few straggler immatures that are wait until the end of middle of March before they split. But wherever there's turkeys, follow the food. Do they nest similarly to bald eagles? Well, that's what we're trying to figure out. But yeah, up in Canada, this eastern population are tree nesters. In the West, they're all food nesters. Right? I, I gotta, I'll tell you real quickly the coolest golden eagle story ever. We got about five minutes. Then this will take four and a half. No, this is fast. <laughs> uh, I did two stents of veterinary work with birds of prey out in, in Meridian, Idaho, which is the outside of Boise, right on the edge of the southern Idaho desert. There's been a big fire. So a lot of prey was gone and we were getting a lot of intergraphics coming in and this rancher, this Idaho desert rancher, I mean this guy is, you know, his face looks like a catcher's mitt. <laughs> Unreal, dude comes in and he, he's cradling the golden eagle like a baby. And he knows Dr. Lee, Doc, Doc, this bird, you know, it's been in bad shape. Got, going after my chickens and got all tangled up in the chicken wire. And she hurt, Doc, she hurt, she's bad, he was just, beside himself. This guy's 70 years old, right? He's built like a tank, too. How all wrapped. Well, it's only like 110 feet I don't know, for God's sakes, it's August. Like, gotta get this stuff off, and I'm unwrapping it. There's blood, blood. I'm like, oh, oh, this bird's in rough shape, man. And the guy's there, be careful, she's scared. Don't, don't hurt her, you know? We won't hurt her, we know we're doing. I get the last wrap off. It's not the eagle's blood. She's got all eight pounds embedded in this guy's forearm. I mean, in to the bone. This man never wins. He never said a word. I'm like, Doc, Dr. Lee. And he's like, Jeff, go get a wrap. I mean, how? She's got, she's starving. She's got fresh, bloody flesh in her arm. Talent. She ain't letting go. So luckily we have some live rats, you know, went and got one, and it's the brutal part, and I'm sorry. We had to make it squeal, get her excited. She let go of him and grabbed it, got her off, scrub it down, and he says to the wife, you better get him to the hospital, he's gonna need stitches. Shoot, doc, I got chores, and he left. <laughs> we went there about a week later with the bird, we fed her up, fed her, got her fat, went and flipped her, and he stood there on his farm field and bawled his eyes out. How flipping cool is that? Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Um, so, uh, next event, we have 2 o'clock, okay, with Soar. Ambassador Decora, one of the Decora Eagles, um, and then I think I, I'm going to give an update after that, three-ish or whatever, whenever I can get set up after K is done, and then we have our celebration dinner at five o'clock. So.